I usually start and end my lecture with the same two, two slides. And I'm going to read to you from an article uh, that was uh, published about the city of New Orleans. Very short. The next day, the storm gathered steam and drew a beat on the city. As it approached the coast, more than a million people evacuated to higher ground. Some 200,000 remained, however. The carless, the homeless, the aged and infirm, and those diehard New Orleanians who look for any excuse to throw a party. The storm hit, pushing a deadly storm surge into the lake. The water crept to the top of the berm and then spilled over. It reached 25 feet, 8 meters in height over parts of the city. People climbed onto roofs to escape it. Thousands drowned in the murky brew that was soon contaminated by sewage and industrial waste. It took two months to pump the city dry, and by then the Big Easy was buried under a blanket of putrid sediment. A million people were homeless. It was the worst natural disaster in the history of the United States. When did this calamity happen? It hasn't yet. That was from an article in National Geographic October 2004, a year before Katrina made landfall on New Orleans. We knew <coughs> exactly what would happen. We knew how many people would remain, as approximately 200,000 was the count. We knew who they would be. We knew what height the water level would reach over the city. We knew roughly how many people would die, how many people would be homeless and how many lives would be shattered. It would have cost between two and three billion dollars to have fixed the levees prior to Katrina making landfall. It is now costing the U.S. taxpayer 200 to 300 billion dollars to try to put the city back together if indeed that's even possible. What scientists are talking about now pales in comparison to what happened in New Orleans. We have to assess what the projections are and whether we're willing, as a human society, whether we're willing to take the risk. So let's first talk about energy. In the U.S., we use about 100 quads of energy right now. We're projected to go up 34 percent to add about another 34 quads of energy between now and the, over the next 25 years to about 2030. The world uses about 400 quads of energy. The U.S. is among, per capita, the highest energy consumers in the world. Canada is actually a little bit higher than the U.S. as the number one consuming per capita country in the world. The world, however, <clears throat> is expected to increase its consumption by 62 percent between now and 2030. One quad, just one quad, is equal to the delivered energy of 41,000 megawatt power plants. A 1,000 megawatt power plant is a, that is the equivalent of one large nuclear facility. A quad is also equal to the delivered energy of 75 500 megawatt coal plants. The United States peaked in oil production in 1970 and in natural gas production in about 1973. And as it increases its consumption, its imports increase dramatically every year. 70% of the remaining oil and gas reserves in the world are located in what's called the strategic ellipse, an area stretching from Saudi Arabia up through Iraq and Iran into the former Soviet Union. Our entire way of life is dependent on this region 
of the world. Global oil and gas is between 40 and 60 years left at present consumption rates, given our known reserves. What other cheap, inexpensive fossil fuel do we have? We have coal. We are building around the globe about one conventional coal power plant a week. The world is moving to coal, make no mistake. Coal is the dirtiest of all fuels. Clean coal technology is decades away if it's proven feasible. Couple that picture in your mind, if you will, with the climate. This is global average temperature going back 450,000 years in blue in the lower range. That means the Earth's been it's usually in a continual ice age. And about every 100, 120,000 years, it comes sharply out of an ice age. The temperature increases dramatically. And we go into what's called, what's termed these interglacial periods up here on the peaks. These are interglacial, interglacial periods. The last interglacial period was about 120,000 years ago. You can see all the blue lines bunched up to the right, on the right of the screen. That's global average temperature for the last 12,000 years during this period of time that we've been able to flourish as a human society. Now look at the red line. The red line is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in parts per million. You can see that the red line sits right on top of the blue line. We have not been over 300 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for the last 450,000 years, probably the last few million years. We are currently off the chart. We are at 382 parts per million today. By 2050, we should be at about 450 parts per million and by 2100, anywhere between 550 and 700 parts per million. This is a huge experiment on the planet. Scientists can only guess what will happen. We burn fossil fuels, it emits carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, about 20 billion tons <clears throat> is emitted. That's actual weight. Two billion tons are soaked up by all the plants, the soils, the trees, the grasses, the shrubs. Another eight billion tons is soaked up by the oceans. The rest goes into the atmosphere, raising the parts per million about 1.7. It used to be, it's now two to 2.2 parts per million per year. So when you hear people say, well, we can plant our way out of this, that's not gonna happen. How do we know it's us? In the black is global average temperature, it's measured. That's measure temperature. Scientists have very sophisticated models. When we run the models with solar variation, volcanic activity, and all other natural phenomena, we get the blue line. We should be about one-tenth of a degree centigrade global warming <clears throat> from pre-industrial levels, 1900. When we add in greenhouse gases, we get the red line sits right on top of the black line, and that's how we know what the difference is, and who's doing, who's doing the warming. We know where the warming is happening. It's happening over Canada, over Alaska, over Greenland, the western part of the United States and Canada more than the northern part of the United States and Canada. And it's expected to continue that way. So the west is expected to dry out and become much, much hotter and the northern latitudes and southern latitudes are expected to increase in temperature much, much greater than the middle of the planet. This is the <coughs> latest IPCC projections. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they project we are right now about seven or eight tenths of a degree centigrade global warming. That's where we are right now, above pre-industrial levels. We're projected to increase over to the right by about 2050. We should reach, in the middle of the models, 
about 2 degrees centigrade by about 2090, 3 degrees centigrade, global warming. And the spread is from high economic activity and population growth to low global economic activity and low population growth. 2 degrees centigrade is termed by scientists dangerous, very dangerous climate change. That is the threshold that the European Union has set for itself and the world as a temperature we do not want to go above. James Hansen testified today that we must keep global average temperature under 450 parts per million, which corresponds to roughly 2 degrees centigrade. 50-50 chance of exceeding 2 degrees centigrade if we pump enough CO2 into the atmosphere to get to 450, which should happen at the present rate by about 2050. He's saying if we get to 450, we probably have an incredibly good chance of destabilizing the ice sheets on both polar ice caps in West Antarctic and Greenland, and it would be then irreversible. Three degrees centigrade is termed by scientists as catastrophic climate change. Hansen and his colleagues at NASA are giving us roughly 10 years to be on the downside of global carbon emissions. Otherwise, we don't have a chance of making it to keep global average temperature under 2 degrees centigrade. This does not have to happen. Anything I talk about, and the solutions are not that hard, which we'll go into, just so you know. I don't want you to get too depressed. Usually people start crying during this part of the presentation. So I want you to know that the good stuff is coming. Okay, so what is a two to three, what are they telling us? What does a two to three degree centigrade world look like? Well, there are no more polar bears. In fact, by 2050, the projections are business as usual. 25% of all plant and animal species on the planet will be gone. Business as usual, if we go to the three degree centigrade, by 2090, 2100, 50% of all plant and animal species on Earth will be gone. What happens? How does that happen? Isotherms are bands of temperature, roughly, that go around the Earth. Isotherms are moving to the poles at the rate of about 30 miles a decade. It, all the plant and animal species that rely on that climate for their survival move with the isotherms. Now, these plant and, plants and animals, in many cases, can't make the trip that fast. There are farms, cities, highways, all sorts of things that interrupt their migration. Many of them can make it and they move. When they get to the poles, the animals and plants and animals that are there or up at the top of a mountain have nowhere to go. There are plants and animals coming up right behind them. And when the temperature gets too warm, they literally move off the planet. And that's how this extinction happens. Snowpack in the Rocky Mountains is expected to decrease between those two temperatures, between 30 and, and about 70 percent. Many cities in the southwest U.S. get their water from the snowpack. We expect that if this thing continues, we could have water wars in the West for who gets the water. Forest fires are expected to double to quadruple, especially in the western United States and Canada. Scientists have tied weather events, extreme weather events. Warm air holds more moisture and is more volatile. They've tied the temperature increase in global warming now to hurricane intensity and water content. So hurricanes will be stronger and hold a lot more water and do a lot more damage. Coral reefs are expected to be bleached, totally bleached between those two temperatures. Coral reefs are home to 25% of all marine species. This is how the IPCC works. 
between 2001 and 2007, scientists are doing the research. They then accumulate all the research and they put together the report and they divide it into the four parts. Now, before the report can be issued, it has to be agreed upon by the governments of all these countries. The governments that have political agendas, like China building one coal plant a week, doesn't want to be embarrassed. The United States, which has no policy on global warming, doesn't want to be embarrassed. And they water down the scientific consensus and reports. The second part, which was the impacts, what's going to happen, got so testy that the woman from NASA, who's our lead scientist, in the middle of the night walked out because the governments tried to play down the impacts. They finally got her back in, they finally reached a compromise, and the report came out. So when the report comes out, we look at who's really going to get hurt by this. And so the report focuses on the people in Africa who have no, didn't cause this problem at all, had nothing to do with climate change. And they're going to be hit the hardest. The headlines were, the world's poorest will suffer the most. We will dig into our pockets and dig deep if we have to, to try to alleviate the suffering. We will send groups over there, we'll send money over there, we'll send blankets over there, we'll send canned goods over there, we'll send whatever we have to send to try to alleviate the situation over in Asia and Africa. But we're not going to change our way of life. I believe that we will not do anything significant to stop this situation unless we see it on our doorstep. And if we keep seeing reports like this come out, that it's going to happen in Asia and Africa, and, it's, and we're home free, we'll be compassionate and we'll do what we can, but we will not alleviate this situation. In the last IPCC report in 2001, the projections were that by 2100 we'd have roughly a meter of sea level rise, with some melting of the ice caps. In this report, they took out any melting of the polar ice caps. We have the satellite data that the ice caps are melting, and they're keeping it out of the report. So as a compromise, what they did is put in this kind of language in three different places in the report. They basically said, that we, can't, we don't know about ice melt because it's a chaotic process and we can't model it, therefore we can't be 100% sure. So they took out any increase in sea level rise besides thermal expansion as the earth warms and glacial melt, which we know we have a, a years and years worth of data of glacial recession, and so that's expected to continue, and so the top 23 inches, two-thirds of a meter by 2100. But then in three places they put this. The last time the polar regions were significantly warmer than present for an extended period, about 125 years, thousand years ago, that was the last interglacial period, reductions in polar ice volume led to four to six meters of sea level rise. We know that during the last interglacial period, Greenland melted in 120 years and sea level rise increased four to six meters during that period of time. Unless we bring this home to the United States and Canada and all those countries that have the wherewithal to deal with this situation, I believe nothing will happen in the US or Canada and before we know it, it will be too late to do anything. We need to get started now. We have 10 years basically to get this situation under control. So we have put together a package that we're working on now. It's mapping sea level rise along the east coast, around the gulf, 
up the West Coast. We should have all this put together within the next two months, and then we take it to Congress and make it public to the American people. It's called Nation Under Siege. This is New York. That's Lower Manhattan. Brooklyn, Queens, <coughs> New Jersey. One meter, three meters, six meters. San Diego over to the west coast. One meter, three meters, six meters. San Francisco, one meter, three meters, six meters. Seattle, one meter, three meters, six meters. Vancouver, this is Richmond, south of Vancouver. Vancouver <laughs> is up to the top. One meter, three meters, gone, six meters. Now, you can say, well, six meters, it's out in time, we don't know, you're alarmist. Okay, let's do the same thing with one meter. It's actually less than a meter. Three quarters of a meter sea level rise, one meter at high tide. Let's go down the east coast again. Norwalk, Connecticut. That's one meter. Long Beach, Long Island, Oceanside, I don't know if you've been there, I used to live down right here. One meter. Atlantic City, gone. One meter. Hampton, Langley Air Force Base, one of our major bases, one meter. Savannah, Georgia, would never survive a hurricane after a meter sea level, or after three quarters of a meter sea level rise. Fort Lauderdale, one meter. Miami Beach, that's one meter of sea level rise. That's what the downtown looks like in Miami, one meter sea level rise. Cape Coral and Sanibel Island on the Gulf side of Florida, gone with one meter. New Orleans, forget about it. Freeport, Texas, the whole coast of Texas is reshaped. Gone. Victoria, one meter. Move over to the left in Victoria, one meter. Honolulu, one meter. The U.S., and because Canada is tied to our hip, and we're tied to your hip, would never survive three quarters of a meter sea level rise. It would destabilize our economy. It would basically destabilize the world. This is what happened after Katrina destroyed New Orleans, which is a relatively small city. This is where all the people went out of New Orleans, impacted every city in the United States. Houston, which opened up its arms, is regretting the influx of people. They didn't have jobs for them, stressed out health care, the school system, the transportation system, housing. They left with nothing. That's just one city. What's going to happen when the entire East Coast goes down with millions of people on the move? Where are they going to go? Who's going to welcome them? What's it going to do to the economy? In New Orleans, they can rebuild it. Once the sea gets there, there's no rebuilding anymore. That land is gone. Trillions and trillions of dollars of infrastructure. I believe 
that when we piece this together and take it to Congress in the next few weeks, two months probably, and get it in front of Congress, and we can get this word out to the American people and to folks in Canada, that it will change the mindset and we will move to solve the problem. And we will not let it get to two to three degrees centigrade because it's obviously not in our best interest. And it's not that we're malicious and it's not that we don't care. It just hasn't been brought home yet. And this brings it home. And in the United States and the Western democracies, when we want to move and do something, there is nothing that can stop us from doing it. Well, what does this have all to do with us here sitting in this room, architects, and why am I talking to architects and planners and landscape architects and building sector professionals and government officials? <coughs> well, in the U.S., the building sector is responsible for 48% of all energy consumption. 48%. 40% is building operations. Heating, lighting, cooling, hot water. 40% of total energy consumption in the U.S. 43% of total emissions in the U.S. is building operations. In Canada, 50%. Because you have a lot of hydro, 36% of total Canadian emissions are attributed to the building sector. And in the U.S., it's the building sector that's driving carbon emissions. All the coal plants, 76% of all the energy generated at power plants in this country, in the U.S., goes just to operate buildings. So if the building sector keeps growing, and you see all the cranes all over Canada coming in from Seattle, kind of like having a building boom, just like I see in Florida, in Florida, they call the crane the national bird. Every time we sink a footing into the ground, we add to the demand side and we add to the pressure to build coal plants or tap the tar sands. Unless we get a handle on the building sector, we don't make it. By the year 2035, in the U.S., 75% of the built environment will be either renovated or new. And that is a huge opportunity if we begin to do it right today, we can turn the situation around. In Canada, we ran the numbers. By 2035, about two-thirds, about two-thirds of the built environment will be either new or renovated. So between us, we have a huge opportunity in the building sector to turn this around. So what do we have to do? We need across-the-board legislation. We need CAFE standards. That means we need to double the mileage of any car put on the road tomorrow. Japan got it right, and they're booming. In the U.S., we're still at, I don't know, what is it, 12, 13, 14 miles per gallon. It's insane. We need legislation in the U.S., for better CAFE standards. We need a global moratorium on building of any new coal plants. The only way we're going to do that is slow down demand in the building sector. If we slow the building sector down, renewables can make up any new demand that we have, and then we can begin the, begin the decline. We need a 25 by 25 renewable portfolio standard. 25% renewables total energy production in the U.S. and Canada by 2025. Wind, solar, biomass, geothermal, not fossil fuels. We need to adopt and implement the 2030 challenge. That's a challenge, a global challenge we issued in January of last year. It's one simple challenge. Doesn't matter where you are. It says that if you're going to build a new building, you must meet an energy performance consumption standard of fossil fuels, greenhouse gas emitting fossil fuels, of half 
the regional average for that building type. So if you're building a school in Vancouver and you know what the schools consume roughly, you take all the schools and divide it by the number, your budget is half. Figure out how to do it. And then we say that you must renovate the same amount of area you build new, down to half. So if you're doing a renovation of a school, cut its consumption by 50%. What that does is, in the US and Canada, we build roughly about the same amount we renovate. And so we're actually doing this already. And so if we renovate down, we make room for the new, we've flattened out the curve. No more demand for electricity, for fossil fuels, for natural gas. We've, in the building sector, we've done our part to level it out. And then we say in order to get the reductions, every five years ratchet it so that by 2030, all new buildings and developments, only new buildings, 50% always across the board for renovation. New buildings, 60% by 2010, 70% reduction by 2015, carbon neutral by 2030, no greenhouse gas emitting, fossil fuel, energy consumption to operate buildings by 2030, design it. U.S. Conference of Mayors adopted the 2030 challenge for all buildings in all U.S. cities. It was unanimous. Does that mean the cities are doing it? No. Does it mean they're on notice to do it and they're trying now to figure out ways to do it? Yes. So how can we meet the 2030 challenge? How difficult is it to do this? This is a daunting task to meet the 50% reduction. There are three ways to meet it and you can't fail. One. Design and innovation. This is what we do as design professionals. Design down as much as you can through design strategies, passive solar heating strategies, passive cooling strategies, daylighting strategies, shading strategies, how you site a building, its orientation, its location. All these have huge implications for energy consumption and they're design strategies. They're the no cost, low cost, cost savings option. And that's at the site scale. This is low tech. And you can do low tech at the community scale, walkable communities like you're trying to do here. Density and infill. We know that density cuts the carbon footprint by about 50% because of public transportation, People live in smaller units in cities. Property values are way up. Transit-oriented developments, so we're not driving in all over the place. All sorts of planning strategies, and planners are on the front line because they're the first ones that make the decisions, that lay out the communities, and that set the design guidelines. And so the 50% needs to be set by the planners so when an architect comes in, that's it. We set all sorts of visual standards, height standards, everything else, 50% standard. End of story. You don't make it, you don't build. Second, we say if you can't make it that way, let's say you can get 30% of the way there. Add technology. All sorts of things coming out. Solar hot water heating, photovoltaics, LED lighting systems, compact fluorescence, photo cells, turn lights off when they're not needed, EMS systems, and at the community scale, if you're doing a community, generate the power, biomass, wood chips, but give people an option so that if they have to buy their way out of it, they can do that, but clean power, the 25 by 25 renewable portfolio standard, can't fail. We have very inefficient buildings in the U.S. This is how much energy a residence actually uses, the typical residence, average residence in the United States. 42,700 BTUs a square foot a year. Commercial industrial buildings and office building, 85,000 BTUs a square foot a year. Those are the glass towers, glass all the way around, no shading, nothing. Inefficient. This is what I tell my U.S. audiences. We recently sent a spacecraft to Saturn, right? 
we actually guided the spacecraft through the rings of Saturn. We took photographs of the rings of Saturn and sent it back to Earth. We actually measured the composition of the material in the rings of Saturn and sent that back to Earth. We had no national emergency. The planet wasn't at stake. Our very survival wasn't at stake. 50% of all plant and animal species on Earth wasn't at stake, and we did that. Now, I want you to look at this graph. We're able to send a spacecraft and measure the rings of Saturn and send that data back to Earth. The planet is at stake. This is what we need. <laughs> and that's what we have delivered to our doorstep. And we can't solve the problem. <laughs> this is mind-boggling and mind-bending. That's what we need. That's what we have. This is just one resource. I'm not talking about geothermal and biomass and wind and wave production. We were talking about that in the car and forget about all the other things. This is just what's delivered to the doorstep. Free, given to you. It's a gift. Figure out how to do it. Why haven't we done it? We're not under siege. There's no national emergency. We haven't put any brain power to it. We haven't put any money to it. There's no immediacy. Believe me, if we throw the dollars at it and put our best minds to it, we will figure out how to take this intermittent source and store this stuff so that we can meet that demand. And then we'll reduce this demand in half, which is what we're asking for. Figure that in half and look at what you get. This is so solvable, it's insane. And we're talking about <clears throat> our president and his wisdom is saying it'll destroy, solving this problem will destroy the U.S. economy. <laughs> and not only that, these are the other resources we have just in the United States. Forget about Canada, which probably has more than the U.S. This is wind, biomass, geothermal, and solar for concentrating solar if we want to make it at a central plant. There's no way we can't solve the problem. We just have to put our minds to it. It just has to be an emergency. And we know we can do it because we had an emergency. And if you looked at the graph way on at the beginning, and I should have pointed this out, of energy consumption in the U.S., it went like this. And then in the late 70s and 80s, it actually went down when we had the first energy crisis because it was brought to the doorstep of the U.S. We didn't have heating oil, the price of gas, there were lines. We reduced, we were on the downside. All of a sudden, in the Middle East, they got smart and figured, uh-oh, they're, they're going to cut us out. They're already there's a sharp decline in consumption. In the U.S., we dropped the price of oil to $10 a barrel, and we're on a binge again, and off we go. So you can't tell me it's not doable. And in the, in the, during that period, the Department of Energy, for example, commissioned 20 buildings. No extra additional money. They had to do it within budget. They gave you money to monitor the building and to do some computer modeling. That's all small grant. They wanted to see how much energy you can squeeze out of a building through design. This is the Mount Airy Library. We did this. We reduced consumption of the Mount Airy Library through daylighting strategies and passive heating and cooling strategies and natural ventilation strategies by 80 percent just through design. We've done it in housing in New Mexico, We've done it in schools, all under 50%. We've done it in an all-glass conservatory. Get about a 90% reduction in consumption by manipulating the properties of the glass on each side of the building. 
to recreate different environments. So we know it can be done. So what do we need to do? We need the government to step up to the plate. We don't need much. The cities want to move. All over the world, the cities want to move. But we need a little bit of help. And in the U.S., what we're calling for, and we have Tom Udall who will be introducing a bill, but what we're calling for is an extension of the Energy Policy Act for five years and a doubling of the tax credits to take the burden off of the cities and to infuse economic activity and money into the cities to meet the targets so that developers don't get complain so they have some, some dollars to meet the targets initially till they get up to speed, five years. And we're asking for all that and we're asking for a national code standard, 50%. Give the states two years to get up to speed. And if they can't, they have to go through a public process and within two years tell us why they can't meet the 50% standard and then go from 50% to carbon neutral. This is a total U.S. standard. We need to partner with industry for a building product rating system, A to F. A within a category, paints, carpet, wood, whatever. Low carbon emissions in the manufacture of the product. F, high carbon emissions and everywhere in between. Architects and building sector professionals and planners, we specify a trillion dollars worth of goods and services a year. We're the largest consuming block in the world. If we start specifying A products instead of F products, every manufacturer will get into the A group. They're not going to go out of business. We want the federal government to lead in the U.S. All federally design, all federal buildings, new buildings or major renovations meet a 60% reduction standard, 10% ahead of everyone else, so they lead the way. And then if you take a dollar of federal funds in the U.S., you meet the 50% target, otherwise you don't get the money. You want the money? 50% reduction. We have a national emergency on our hands. We've got to get a grip on this. You want money, you meet the targets. And we need local incentives and the local governments are giving the incentives. So the federal incentives on top of the local incentives will work and we need a performance-based code rather than a prescriptive code. You show that you comply with the 50% target through computer simulations, through approved modeling. And it's happening in California. And we need design tools. Architects and building professionals and planners are like kids. What happens on Christmas? Christmas morning, kids get up. There's all sorts of presents under the tree. There's a box under the tree. Kid runs, his name is on it, he grabs the box, he rips it open, it's a computer game. Ninja something or, you know, some kind of uh, auto racing game or whatever. War games, something, football. Rips open the paper, rips open the box. The box is usually about that big. There's a big manual in there, it's about that thick. Takes the manual out, he throws it over there, gets his hand back in, he's got the disc. Runs over to the computer, sticks the disc in, and within an hour, he's chopping off heads and he's, and he's driving up mountains and, and uh, shooting people and doing whatever he's doing. Now, the movement of the wrist, doing that, you know how much computing power is behind just the one movement? Huge behind the scenes. All he wants to know is how to move the wrist and I'm pushing the buttons and I'm there. When architects design buildings, their children, they don't want to know DOE 2 and what insane computer program is behind the analysis of buildings. All we need is a design tool, is a box in the corner of the tool. It has two numbers in it. We want a box in the corner of the design tools. We want one, the target, the 50% target, and the other number, what the design is doing. And as I turn the building around, that bottom number changes. This happens to be a conservatory we did. 
we use double glass. If we change the double glass to a low coated glass and the number goes from red to green and I'm now below the target, I made a good decision. If I put glass on the west side of a, of a residence and I'm modeling a residence and the number goes up through the roof, uh oh, bad decision. I take it, I put it on the south side, oh, it goes down into the green, all of a sudden I know south side good, west side bad. <laughs> My brain has now picked that up. <laughs> and I put an overhang on it, whoa, it goes down even further, amazing. I stretch the overhang out, uh oh, the number's going back up, let me push it back in. Oh, it's going down, down, now it's going back up. Yep, there it is. I got it. That's all we need is a box in the corner. You give us that little box in the corner of a design tool, and we will be under 50% in every design we do. It will be like playing games. We will have a great time doing it, and all our buildings will be under 50%. We've been screaming about this for two years. We've been telling Autodesk, give us the box. We've been telling Google SketchUp, please, just give us the box. <laughs> we still haven't gotten the box yet. How hard is it to give us the box to save the planet? You give us the box, we save the planet. We've issued a challenge to the schools. It's called the 2010 imperative. And what we're asking the schools to do the design faculty in studio, which is where everything happens, is one thing, very simple. Add a sentence to the projects that you give to students. You want to save the planet? Add a sentence. We're not asking you to change your way of life. We're not asking you to change how you teach. We're not asking you to do anything except write in a sentence to the problems you give to students, that their design engage the environment in a way that dramatically reduces or eliminates the need for fossil fuels. Every project they design, meet this target. Don't change the problem. It's a hospital, give them a hospital. It's a house, give them a house. Design it carbon neutral. Instruct it or not have to know anything. The students will get together, get on the internet, they'll figure it out. Let them teach the instructors. If we get the instructors to do this, in the universities, in the West, we will change design education in a year forever. And the students coming out will have jobs because this is what the profession is demanding. The AIA adopted the 50% targets. All the offices, the large ones that I know of, are clamoring to find people who can deliver and design buildings like this. You spend $120,000 in the U.S. or $200,000 to get an education and you can't design carbon neutral, you're not going to have a job because we have to move that way. And then we're saying that the total program by 2010 ought to be ecologically literate. That means every course, if you draw a circle on a piece of paper, you need to know what it means, what materials are going in there, where it's coming from, who's producing it, how many plant and animal species on earth you're removing, what the water content is, on and on. We need, we need a whole new way of thinking about what we do in our actions. Otherwise, we're not going to make it. And then we need the design campuses, the schools within the campuses, to lead and get their buildings carbon neutral so that the kids designing and going to school in these buildings are in a carbon neutral building by 2010. And we're beginning to get schools now accepting the challenge. And we're going to get a certification system in place within a year to certify that schools are doing this. And let's see the schools that aren't doing it, that aren't certified, compete for the really good students. So I leave you with this, with two things. This is in the US. This is where we're projected to go. And we will fuel global warming. This is what the government is telling us business as usual is in the US. If we adopt the 2030 targets, and we are, if we implement them and we have a national emergency, we will implement them and we would get into the target range to keep global warming under two to three degrees centigrade and we will do our part. Will China do its part? 
Will India do its part? You bet they'll do their part. If they see the U.S. moving its building sector, you think they want to choke their people to death with coal plants? And they see that it can be done in the U.S.? The great thing about China is whatever the U.S. does, it copies immediately and goes one better. <laughs> Anything we do, they're over here, they copy it, boom. And they do it one better. This is the slide I always end on. This is my granddaughter. She lives in California, in Southern California. I am 66 years old. I have had an incredible life. It has been provided to me by this planet. I live in one of the greatest democracies on earth. I have been able to do everything I have wanted to do in life. I have traveled broadly. I have lived in other countries. I have produced buildings, some good, some not so good. I've had kids. I have three dogs. I have done all these things. I have enjoyed traveled to Machu Picchu, to some of the greatest places on the planet, seen sights that'll make you cry. If we don't get a handle on this, these kids will not grow up in that environment. We owe it to them, those of us who are older, to leave them the planet the way we have enjoyed it. And those of you who are young, you need to demand of this generation and those in power that they leave you that opportunity. Thank you.